<laughs> yeah, re welcome to class, everyone. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Hang on. Share my screen. So let's go abs.gov.au. And census data is what we're looking for. And I'm going to pick a suburb in Adelaide called Torrensville. Torrensville is very similar to Yarraville in Melbourne and Erskineville in Sydney, if you're looking for some comparables. It's a, a gentrifying suburb relatively close to the city. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate some of the key people stats that I look for when I'm trying to determine an up-and-coming suburb. So then let's open up another tab because we need to compare uh, data sets. So abs.gov.au again, census 2011. So use the drop down menu there, 2011 and typing in Torrensville, Torrensville SA State Suburb. That's the one that we want. Now, I mean, if this, like if this was easy, everyone would be able to analyze the data, but the problem is even from the ABS, it's not formatted exactly the same way every time. So you will see that the 2016 data, the, the data sets are not that they have on quick stats are not exactly the same as they have in 2011. But anyway, let's go to 2016. So uh, we're looking at, so we've got people stats. So you see here in green, well, actually that's no, here in black is people. And then we go further down, we see dwellings and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Okay, so let's have a look at the stats that matter so far as property prices are concerned. First one I would like to have a look at is, hang on, people open up people lots of lots of stats i want to show you this one so in torrensville university or tertiary institution that is people going to to uni or other tertiary institutions is 34.6 percent of the population compared to south australia where it's 16.2 so that's just over double a typical South Australian suburb. So 34% of the population go to uni. If I go to 2011 stats, drop down menu, look at this one, right, 26.8% back in 2011, but that's when South Australia, the typical South Australian suburb had 14.4%. So I, look, I know I might be losing some of you so far as the mass is concerned, but honestly, if you can add, take, multiply, divide, you should be able to do this. So what I'm looking at, has the, has the percentage of people going to uni increased at a faster rate than the state average? So what I've done, if I go back to 2016, I went 346, sorry, 34.6 divided by 16.2, which gave me 2.14. And then I came back to 2011 and it was 26.8 divided by 14.4, which gave me 1.86. Now, just so, for the viewers that, um, well, the listeners that aren't viewing, what you're doing, Kate, is dividing the percentage of current university um, attendees with the state percentage. So you're determining the ratio um, for Torrensville um, and the state, and you're looking at it, segmenting it over 11 and 16 to census data collections to see what the rate of change or the rate of increase is for attendees in Tor Torrensville. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation, Kate. Very, very well done. So in 2011, Torrensville had 1.86 times more the state average. In 2016, it had 2.14. Now, people currently going to those institutions is not a big deal because Uni students, or if we look at these others, primary school students, high school students, they're not going to determine property prices because they're not buying property. But that is an interesting stat, in particular for inner city suburbs, and I'm going to come back to that. All right, the very... Peter, Peter, can I yes, just mate. ask you a quick question? In our location at one of the stats that we get on dem demographics that we built is um, the people who have a bachelor's degree level and above. Yeah. 
Um, do you do you look at the increase in that as yeah. well, or yeah? That's one of the factors that I'm looking at today, yeah? Yeah. and I'll show people how to do that one. All right, so the next one I'm looking at is occupation. So if we go back to the 2016 census, quick stats, let's have a scroll down, look for occupation. And what I'm looking for is professionals. So it's the first listed one. So in Torrensville, there were 27% of people that lived in Torrensville are professionals, but the typical South Australian suburb average is 20.3. Then I go to the 2011 census and I look for uh, occupations. Here it is, professionals. Back then it was 25.9% compared to a South Australian average of 19.6. So if I do the division sum again, as Kate said, having on the top line the state average, uh, sorry, the suburb average, on the bottom line, the state average, so we get a ratio. So 27.0 divided by 20.3 equals 1.33. In 2011, 25.9 divided by 19.6 gives us 1.32. Only a very small increase, very subtle. Now, some people might say that it doesn't matter, but if you go back 10 years, you'll see a bigger difference. You go back 15 years, you'll see an even bigger difference again. All right, so occupation is one of the critical elements. Next one is median weekly income. And you've got three choices here, personal, family, and household. I don't look at the personal one because Torrensville is a good example. We've got so many uni students that live in Torrensville, their personal income is not going to be that high. Households, well, a bunch of uni students in a house is a household. So that's not going to give me a good indicator either. So the one that I look for is family. So the family, the median weekly income in Torrensville in 2016 was $1,636 per week. And in South Australia, it was 1,510. So just over one times. If we go to 2011 and look for median weekly income for family, we got 1,327 compared to 1,330, which interestingly is less than one. So, so far as median weekly income is concerned, in 2011, it was 0.99 of a typical South Australian suburb. Fast track five years and it was 1.08. It had increased quite significantly in just a five year period. Because one of the points I'm trying to make here, for a suburb to increase in value significantly, you need wealthier people to be moving in or buying in. They don't always move in because there are many expensive places on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria and on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, but uh, wealthy people don't necessarily live there permanently, but they do have their holiday houses there. So what we're looking for is incomes increasing in the area, which is to me is a very is one of the very key indicators that it is an up and coming suburb. All right, go back to 2016. And now we're going to be looking at property. So we're looking at dwellings. And in particular, I'm looking at tenure. So I know Kate and Dave and I have talked about it quite a bit. Suburbs where you don't have a lot of renters, is a good suburb. One that's dominated by owner occupiers is a good one. In Torrensville in 2016, 36.5% of people rented compared to the South Australian average of 28.5. If I go to the 2011 uh, stats, looking at tenure rented, it's 35.1% percent compared to 27.9 if i do the sums so here it's 36.5 divided by 28.5 is 1.28 and if i go here 35.1 divided by 27.9 is 1.26 um, so actually the amount of people that are renting has increased now you would think oh well you know if that was one of the key factors or indicators then it's not an up and coming suburb. 
But remember that the number of uni students, the proportion of uni students living in Torrensville has increased. Most of these people would rent. So we shouldn't just look at any one indicator and say, you know, well, it's definitely in or it's definitely out. When you do some analysis and you have a look at what might be causing it, then you get a better picture. Dave or Kate, did you want to throw in anything while we're while I'm talking? I don't want to bore everyone. No, I'm um I'm I just took a, a quick picky so that we can let our listeners know that they also have some viewing for this particular. All right, Dave, I'm particularly interested in your comments on this one. So I look at mortgage monthly repayments. Yeah, but in particular, I look at households with mortgage repayments greater than or equal to 30% of household income. Because let's say, I'll give some extreme examples just to make the example clearer. If you're on 200, if you've got a household income of 200,000 and let's say your, your mortgage repayment is 30% of that, which is 60,000, you still got 140,000 to play with. Yeah. But if your household income is only 50,000, and your mortgage repayment is 30% of that, then which is 15,000, you've only got $35,000 to play with. So yeah. people on higher incomes can afford to have bigger mortgages. Yeah. So you, you would agree with that, Dave? Absolutely, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's a type of sort of interesting stat, statistic that doesn't really get talked about, but... Mm -hmm it um, does is the type of thing that impacts property prices, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so if we look here, 5.1% of the population in Torrensville had a mortgage repayments greater than or equal to 30% of household income compared to the South Australian average of 6.6. .6. If we go to 2011, it's 6.6 .6 divided by 8.8. .8. So if I do the maths, in, 19, in 2011, we had 75% of people with uh, quite large mortgages. In 2016, we had 77%. So very subtle change, but still a change. Okay, now that's the easy part. Now I'm going to demonstrate how there are other stats to look at other than just quick stats. So, Dave, you mentioned level of highest educational attainment, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, if I go back to 2016, let's look at people. You look at this stat here, don't you, Dave? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay. That's so, bachelor, bachelor, yeah. Yeah, bachelor degree level and above, 29% of people in Torrensville had a bachelor degree or, bet, or higher compared to a South Australian average of 18.5. So that's 1.57 times as much. Now, the reason I look for this, and I'd be interested to find out, Dave, why you look at it, is generally people with universities degrees earn more. People that earn more are willing to pay more for many things, including housing. Dave? Yeah, exactly right. You know, they're generally more employable and, yeah, more employable with higher levels of income right okay so please stay with me because i know i know there's a lot of numbers and data here but now we're going to have to go into a little bit more detail so let's open up another tab all right go back go to the abs again abs.gov.au census data now we're looking at something different called community profiles so click on community profiles uh, i i want 2011 I want Torrensville. Click on go. I click on the basic community profile. It's going to download a zip file. We open up the zip file. We open up the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because in 2016, uh, the level of highest educational attainment, bachelor degree or above, is in quick stats. But in 2011, it's not. So we have to go to, to more detailed data. So here we've got the cover, not important, contents, list of tables. 
I prefer to look for a list of topics. So what we're looking for is education. So you click the tabs, looking for education, and here it is, education and qualifications, table B40, non-school qualification, level of education by age and sex. I'm not really interested in the breakdown between male and females. What I am interested in is the total number, which is here. So here it actually breaks it down to bachelor degree, graduate diploma and graduate certificate, postgraduate level. So those three there add up and then I divide it by the total. So what I've got is uh, I, add, I added these up and it works out to 767 divided by 1,750. And uh, so, so that makes it 31% in, uh, in uh, 2016, it was 44. So we've got 1.42. So basically what we've got is from 2011 to 2016, we've got a higher proportion of people with university qualifications moving into Torrensville. But be careful. Remember, we've got a lot more students living in Tyronsville. So they could be students that already have an undergraduate degree doing postgraduate study. So again, you don't just look at one, one piece of data and think, you know, this is it. You need to do your analysis and try and work out what is happening and why it's happening. Intriguing because we're looking at raw data here. You've extracted a file that shows that Torrensville is two square kilometres. So it's a little place. It is. And we're looking at individual <laughs> counts. So this is very manual and I think anyone listening to it will want to have a, a watch of the video because otherwise it, it's a little harder yeah. to follow. But intriguing, you're really drilling into this. So, okay. yeah, look, I, I agree with you, Kat. You really should watch, uh, go to our uh, podcast notes and click on the Zoom recording to watch this. What, what it also highlights for our listeners is how difficult it is to gather data and get the right data. And, yeah. you know, Peter's going beyond just the numbers that you can access, which takes some time. And this is just one suburb. You know, he's then dividing it, working out growth rates relative to, uh, to, to the state um, and different things like that. So it just, it's a really good reinforcement of, of, even though we're in the world of mass data, it's still very difficult to gather data for property assessment. Um, and there's so many different data points to consider as well. Okay. Just touching on a few. Yeah. So, now we have to go and look at the community profile for the 2006 data. So let's open up another tab for the ABS, click on census, go to community profiles. We want 2016 Torrensville. Oops. Peter's typed in Torrensville and is hitting go on the <laughs> ABS site. <laughs> General community profile, download the zip file, open up the zip file, open up the Excel spreadsheet. Now, I know I've been talking a lot, but hopefully you remembered that one of the key indicators that I look for is median weekly income, so far as the family is concerned. And this, this next, uh, next category, in my opinion, is the next or well, is equally as important. So there, out of all the data sets that I look at, these are the two most important. One is uh, having a look at the family median weekly income, if that's increasing. And the other one is having a look at, having a look at the proportion of people that have moved into the area. So this is called usual address and internal migration, but we need to go to the uh, community profile to check this one out. So let's have a look at list of topics. And uh, it's on list of topics three, G42, place of usual residence five years ago by sex. So I can see in 2016, there were 2,033 people that lived at the same address in Torrensville compared to a total population of 3,800. 
That's 53%. Now, I'm going to fast track this because I don't want to bore too many of you. Then I went to the 2011 community profile, which is table B39, if you want to find it yourself. And I calculated that 59% of the people then had lived in Torrensville for at least five years at the same address. Then, just to illustrate my point, I went to the 2006 census data and discovered that back then, 63% of the people lived at the same address in Torrensville. So let, let me just take you back. 2006, 63% of people were living at the same place for at least five years. 2011, dropped to 59%. 2016, dropped to 53%. So we've gone in 10 years from 63% to 53%. But when you compare it to South Australia, for that 10 years, typically it remained at 58 to 59%. So typically in South Australia, 58 to 59% lived at the same address for the five years beforehand. And that's been consistent. Whereas in Torrensville, there are more people moving out and other richer people moving in. So to me, that is a very critical element. You can't just expect that people that are living in the area, their wages are going to increase significantly in a short period of time and they'll be able to pay more for property in their own suburb. What you're looking for is wealthier people moving into a suburb and that's what's going to force prices up. And an interesting point to that, because it, it makes it sound so horrible when you think about people being pushed out of their community. But when we flip it on its head, we know a lot of people live in these gentrifying suburbs and haven't got the incomes or the surplus cash to renovate their properties or extend or improve. And when they have a massive value gain as a result of gentrification, they see it as an opportunity to take their money and run and go, go into another area and get the product that they want. And that's a, something that we see all the time when we're canvassing these houses that are primed for renovation. Very good. All right, and just one more to finish off. So we look, so basically all the stats that I've looked at so far are demand. I'm going to look at one which is supply. So I'm looking at dwelling count. I'm looking at the number of dwellings in the suburb. So here I've got a total of 1,552 plus 204 equals 1,756 in 2011. Where are we? 2011. Yeah. Here we are, 1,584 plus 126 equals 1,710. Basically, there's been an increase of 46 dwellings, which as Kate mentioned before, Tarnsville is such a tiny suburb, you know, 46 is significant for this tiny suburb. So that's been a 3% increase in supply of housing. But when I compare it to the South Australian average, and that's adding these numbers here, right? 638782 plus 92242. And this one here, I see that in South Australia, typically there's been a 4% increase in supply. So in Torrensville, the supply of houses is lower than the state average. So we've got we've got people on higher incomes moving in at a greater rate than the state average. And we've got supply lower than the state average. So those two combined will give us higher capital growth than average. And you, ju you just need to go back to 2000 and compare it to 2006, 2011. Even now, you can go up to 2020 and you will see property prices in Torrensville are growing much faster than the state average. Now, these stats that I've gone through, they're just some of the demographic stats that I look at. You know, we've, I mean, we've all written articles about gentrification and, you know, some of the quirky things that I look for is public art, especially art on electricity poles, 
Um, I know in the neighbouring suburb of Theberton, there's a gin distillery, there's a, a microbrewery. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that you can look at that give you an indication of the type of people that are moving into the area. Look, one of the reasons I picked Torrensville is because I've lived in Torrensville most of my life. So I have seen it gentrify. You know, I've seen it when the driveways were full of old Fords and Holdens, and now there's Audis and BMWs. Which are you, you know? driving, Pete? <laughs> A very, very old BMW. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, these are just some of the, that's some of the qualitative research. So what, I've, what we've done here is quantitative. Quantitative comes from the word quantity, looking at numbers. Qualitative comes from the word quality, looking at uh, opinions, um, yeah, and not necessarily based on numbers. Oh, so look, I'm sorry that I've dominated the, the podcast, but I just thought it was important that when, when we talk about stats, we're not just talking about what is the current situation. I like to look at what is the trend. I've only had time today to look back five years. Generally, I like to look back 10 years. So look at three lots of census data. It's intriguing, Pete. You've, you, of course, you were going to dominate this one because this is something that you've pioneered and, and studied and put out there. And we all have turned to you for assistance with gentrification studies. Um, something that is intriguing for me, or, or a really fun look at it. And it's very, um, it's not necessarily diving into the detail, but it's a great reflection. You've talked about the aspects that we can visually spot in a community that might trigger us to look closer at the data. So for example, street art, I also look at, at pet wear shops. You know, if someone's got designer dog gear and there's multiple <laughs> shops in an area, that, that suggests that there's a fair bit of money rolling around there. And the same can be said for degustation menus. If we've got fast food and burger places and in and out, that, that's very different to book three months in advance and seven course degustation and uh, only limited seating and ridiculous prices. They're the things that can signal an area is about to go off. If, you, if you're breaking into somewhere like, well, for example, Seddon, you've studied Seddon in Melbourne, Pete. It's done mm -hmm. all of these things. And we've got places that are hard to get into and cost some people a week's wages to dine at. That's, that's something to really take... Um, pay attention to and, and then delve into the, the data further. And I, I remember a couple of weeks ago, Kate, you were talking about Footscray and West Footscray, and this is exactly what's happening there. And, you know, you mentioned that name and people think, oh, geez, I don't want to invest there. But you, you, you're investing with your head and not your heart. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, there are, uh, Richmond is a classic example in, in Melbourne. Like you're, you're going to an auction in Richmond tomorrow, aren't you, Kate? You're bidding yes. at an auction? Yep. You know, 50, 40, 50, 60 years ago, nobody wanted to live in Richmond because that's where all the criminals live. But, you know, fast track 50, 60 years and that's all changed. And, and the foundations or the fundamentals, other than these stats, is the suburb needs to be very close to the city or the sea, and it needs to have a high concentration of historical buildings, character, period style homes, if we're talking private dwellings, and also older style dwellings if we're talking public buildings or commercial buildings. That's what we're looking for. Seddon, Yarraville, Richmond, Erskineville, Torrensville, all of these places fit that mold. Exactly. Amazing. I mean, ultimately, if you just looked at it as a location without any of the potential stigma associated with the location, that is when you break it down, what you're looking at, because the location is really strong, but there's a stigma around the suburb um, that for whatever reason has occurred and now it's starting to change because people are realising, well, they can actually get a pretty affordable property here and still be really close proximity to, you know, as you just said, Pete, the CBD um, or the ocean. And that's, that's ultimately what it is. Um, and... and yeah. And over time, people can move out, as we've demonstrated, right? Criminals moved out of Richmond. Um, and this has happened, you know, in many other places where one group of people moves out, another group of people move in. But the one thing you can't change is the location of that suburb. It's always going to be 
two or three or four or five kilometres to the city. Yeah. And it's always, or maybe not always, but certainly for the for the next 100 years or so, it's going to have those classic historical buildings. Yeah. And it comes back to the rule of what are the things that are most, that are the hardest to change about a property. Mm -hmm. and the location of the plot of land and the dwelling type. And they are ultimately what drives out performance. That's right. Because right, you can change the size of the building, can't you? You can put an extension on it. You can change the size of the land by subdividing or maybe buying the neighbour's land. But you are definitely not going to change the location. That's impossible. And the style of dwelling, well, you'd have to knock it down to, yeah. to change it, which would be very expensive and quite difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you're doing that for lifestyle purposes and you have a fair bit of surplus cash if you're doing a knockdown, complete build, generally speaking. So I just, uh, and also just for the listeners, you know, with that um, stat of Peter's in terms of um, the lower um, growth in the number of dwellings for the suburb relative to the city or state. So that, that correlates with lower population growth. Okay, if there's less dwellings, you, you're going to generally have less population growth. And so this is a really important point that you want to see population growth on a macro level. So say for the whole city, but on a micro level, you're looking for suburbs that um, are tightly held. It's hard to develop, you know, it's hard to get through council. So you actually have less, a lower proportion of increase in dwellings, which also results in a lower proportion of increase in population. So... Great, uh, great episode, Pete. Um, I'm sure our listeners will get double benefit. They'll be able to <laughs> listen to it and then watch you. And watch well. it. <laughs> Apologies if I put on my teacher voice, but I just needed to, to get through it because there was so much stuff to get through. And look, we could do many episodes on this because I've only really looked at the ABS data. There are other sources that I look at for quantitative data. And there's also what I think is invaluable going to the suburb and walking around like kate said are there dogs wearing waistcoats yeah um are there do the uh, you know cafes and restaurants have degustation menus out there and these sorts of things you don't see sitting behind a computer calculating numbers you have to get out and about talk to people and walk the streets yeah when there starts I being love this. poodles being walked along your street you know <laughs> gentrification has occurred <laughs> <laughs> that's right all right, look, that's been a great episode. Uh, you know, it's a really wonderful insight into Pete's genius with gentrification and how complex the data is. You know, we've really only touched on three or four data points and there are so many. So I really, I'm sure we can, we can we've can, we done episodes in the past on data and we, we will do some more. But I look forward to both of your gold nuggets. 